Hey everybody and welcome back to Jim's Garage. Today's the day. If you've been following my home lab series, you know that I run Kubernetes. But we haven't touched on that yet in the home lab series. That changes right now. This is the first video in a series of seven where I'm going to teach you how to set up Kubernetes within your home lab. Now, this isn't necessarily for everyone, but it is a really handy tool to understand. And with a bit of trial and error, you should be able to get this up and running in your home lab. So I said there's going to be seven videos. So what do those look like? Well, this video is the first, and I'm going to be telling you what Kubernetes is and why I think you should spin it up in your home lab. Even if you're not going to be using it long term, I think it's an excellent skill set to learn. And it underpins pretty much every large organization out there. Because Kubernetes is such a mammoth beast, there's a ton of stuff to get through. So the second video is going to look at how we prepare to deploy Kubernetes. That's right. This isn't something I think we can just get done in a single video. We need to set up a number of virtual machines. We need to get some networking in place, make sure that we've got the right hardware. We might even want things like two physical machines. So we'll cover that in the second video. The third video is the actual deployment. And we're going to be deploying K3S using KubeSpray. I'll come on to that later, but that's basically the script that's going to run to deploy this and get everything up and running. And just so you know ahead of time, there's lots of different variants of Kubernetes. And K3S, I think, is a good balance for a home lab because it's light and minimalist, but it's still feature packed. Once we've deployed Kubernetes, video four is going to focus on management. Now, I'm going to be managing this using Rancher. And throughout the video series, we're going to be deploying tools from the Rancher stack. So Rancher is a bit like Portainer, but at a bigger scale. Once we've done that, we need to think about storage. So video five is going to look at persistent storage within Kubernetes. And like I said, using the Rancher stack, we're going to be looking at Longhorn. But do understand that there's a ton of other alternatives out there, things like Ceph, for example. Once we've got the basics set up, video six is going to focus on deploying our first applications. So once we've got Kubernetes deployed, once we've got some management in place, we're in a good position to start spinning up and transferring our applications from, say, Docker into Kubernetes. The final episode within the series will focus on Fleet. Now, Fleet is Rancher's implementation of GitOps. So at the end of this video series, you'll be able to push configurations into GitHub and automatically have that deployed within your environment. This is great for not only ease of use and management of your containers, but also replication, failover, and self-healing. So there's a whistle-stop tour of what we're going to cover and the logical order of things. But let's get back into this video and talk about what is Kubernetes and why would we want to have this in our home lab, or more so, why do people use it in general across large organizations? So in its most basic primitive analogy, Kubernetes is a bit like running multiple Docker hosts that are all communicating with one another. What do I mean by that? Well, you might have a single Docker host, you might have two Docker hosts, you might even have three, but odds are they're operating independently, unless you're running something like Docker Swarm. We'll come on to that in a minute. That might be fine for you, but there are obvious management issues with that. Now, you can attach them through things like Portainer and manage them independently, but through a single GUI. But that's still not high availability because it isn't smart enough to know that when a container fails on one, it will spin it up on another. So we don't have high availability and we don't have self-healing. Now, as I mentioned, Docker Swarm came in to try and rescue this, but it was quickly superseded by Kubernetes. So Docker Swarm was the first attempt really to be able to bridge and manage multiple Docker hosts and create something that is a bit like what we would now have with Kubernetes. So with that in mind, what you would do is have lots of machines, virtual or physical, all running Docker, but they're connected. And you would deploy a container, so something like traffic, with some logic built into it that says, no matter what, I always want to have one traffic container available. So with that specified, Docker Swarm would always be looking to see, hey, is one traffic instance up and running? If it isn't, we need to go and fix that and deploy it. And it does get a bit more in depth than that, but basically it will look for a node that's available, i.e. that virtual or physical Docker host that has the sufficient resources to be able to then go and spin up another container. And if everything goes to plan, you should always have one traffic instance available. Now, 
there is also the option to say, hey, I want two or I want three or you pick a number dependent on your need. And there's intelligence built into it so that it should scale with load. So we're getting on to high availability, but also load balancing, which is another key concept for the whole multi-cluster high availability setup, which typically is now fulfilled with Kubernetes. So Kubernetes was originally developed by Google and then open sourced. And one huge company that really kind of championed it and integrated into their stack was actually Netflix. Now, I like to use this company for analogy when talking about Kubernetes because it's something we can all simply relate to, right? And their use case of Kubernetes is perfect for what it was designed for. So let's say you're Netflix and the latest and greatest new series comes out. Now, you can imagine on day one that it releases, there's going to be a huge spike in demand for that particular series. So what would you do in that instance? You wouldn't want to be scrabbling and setting up lots of servers manually or even through an automated deployment. No, you want an environment that is already set up for scalability. So let's say, for example, they're using traffic and a few databases and some data sets. That's way too simplistic, but just to get your head in gear. So when that video drops and they're seeing users spiking, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions, their architecture will be set up through code to scale with it. So for example, you might set thresholds so that you only ever want 70% CPU usage or certain network throughput. And when it starts to breach that tolerance, it spins up another instance, another instance, another instance. And because you've got Kubernetes set up, and all of the nodes understand what the nodes are capable of, their understanding of what resources they have, and they can all communicate through networking. They can spin up more and more containers and expand both horizontally and vertically. So as the demand increases, so does their infrastructure. There are more traffic instances, more data sets, more data, all of that good stuff. So that elasticity means that they can meet demand and also scale it down if they don't need it. And this is a really great example of how to use Kubernetes to meet the needs of your customers, or in this case, what we're going to be doing, our home lab. We want to make sure that we have certain applications always available, no matter whether a node goes up or down. And it's great if you do it in tandem with, say, my HA firewall setup, because you could physically take one of your nodes down, all of your applications would fail onto the other node, and everything should still be up and running. So let's have a quick think about what the benefits are of running this within your home lab. So number one, it's going to teach you Kubernetes, which, as I've said, most large organizations will be using Kubernetes and at the very least will be using some sort of containerization or container orchestration engine. Now, Kubernetes is the clear front runner and it doesn't really have any competition in this space. It's also going to help you out with management. Now, do not underestimate, there's a lot to learn in these videos and it's gonna take you some time to adapt to it. What I recommend is if you've got the hardware and the resources available, is to spin this up in parallel with your existing Docker environment and at a time you feel comfortable or in a staged approach, start moving some of those applications over to Kubernetes. Now, I've already touched on this before, but one of the key advantages is that resiliency. So you're gonna be able to have something that is self-healing, a bit like Docker when you say restart always, but I never find that tends to work too well. Whereas in Kubernetes, as I've demonstrated in one of my live videos, I was able to completely shut off one of my nodes, including the one with my primary firewall on, and all of my applications switched over seamlessly to the other machine, as well as my auxiliary firewall picking up and maintaining internet access. And that's really powerful because it means that I can tinker with my home lab not worrying too much about breaking things and the rest of the family aren't inconvenienced. So all of this sounds really good, but how does Kubernetes actually work? And what components are needed to enable all of the features and benefits that I've just mentioned? <laughs> and the answer is lots of virtual machines. So in order to have high availability, replication, failover, etc., we need to have what are called masternodes. Now, these masternodes sit within your Kubernetes cluster. That's right, it's a bit like that Proxmox cluster. We have multiple machines all within the same sort of hive mind, as it were. And the role of these masternodes is basically to be in charge of the whole container orchestration deployments. 
So these masters are always available and you can have more than one. You would probably want more than one for failover. And they distribute work to what are called worker nodes. Now the worker nodes are different from the masters because they do all the work. Now while we've traditionally called things containers within Docker and that's still accurate, we tend to work with the notion of pods within Kubernetes because pods can contain multiple containers. We'll come on to that later in the series. But effectively when you deploy a configuration within Kubernetes and a bit like I said earlier, you want traffic, you want two instances and you always want those to be available. The master node takes that as a blueprint or a template. They're actually called manifest deployments or you could use a Helm deployment, more on that later. And it makes sure that that's true. Now it does that by communicating with workers. And Kubernetes is really cool because you can assign labels to different nodes within your cluster that basically instructs Kubernetes what you want it to be used for. So in my example, and we'll get onto this later, I specifically have certain VMs within my cluster that have more cores and more RAM, and I designate those as workers, and I only allow pods, containers, to be deployed onto those nodes. That means all of my master nodes and my storage nodes they can be really small in terms of CPU footprint and RAM footprint because they only need to do the bare minimum, which is making sure that the network and all the configurations are as specified. And I have one worker node on each physical machine so that that failover is not only within inter VMs, it's also inter physical machine as well. So great for redundancy. And if we peel back the layers, all of this is done with network communications via the Kubernetes API. And that is constantly checking and pinging and making sure that containers are available and they meet the specification that was stipulated with your deployment. And the great news is you can simply update Kubernetes deployments at any time. And fingers crossed, if you've done it correctly, it should then go and self-replicate, self-heal and get it back to the state that it wants to be. The key thing here is it's always trying to satisfy the deployment state. So if you've got two, it's always trying to say two. Once it's got two, it's always checking, hey, have I still got two instances? And as I mentioned, the API server sits on that control plane and makes sure that everything is communicating and talks in a common language, common protocols that Kubernetes understands and expects. ETCD or etcd, not sure how you want to pronounce that one, that again sits within the control plane and is a key value store to make sure that all of the data, all of the accurate variables are replicated across your control plane. So that's really important, again, if you can imagine for HA and reliability. You wouldn't want your one control plane machine to go down and you've lost all of your configuration because the workers wouldn't know what to do, they wouldn't be being instructed, and then you wouldn't have any intelligence, any HA, and things would start to go wrong very quickly. There's the scheduler within Kubernetes, which sole purpose is to schedule pods onto nodes. So once you've deployed your configuration into Kubernetes, it says, hey, you want this number of instances of that pod, and I'm going to go and find out where to put those. And that will be on your respective nodes, and it will abide to things like the labels that you've specified. So you could have something like, I only want my Jellyfin to be deployed on servers where I have a label of a GPU. So it will go and look for a node with a GPU that has the resources available and it will assign that pod onto that node. Now, do appreciate that this is a very whistle-stop tour and I'm going to drop the documentation in the description below. Please do go and read it. It's pretty interesting stuff about how all this works, but you will want a cup of coffee to get through that one. And so if we have a look at a network diagram of how all this pins together, you can basically see where your existing Docker solution sits within Kubernetes, but it's kind of like just the worker node. So the key difference here is we have that control plane with the master nodes, and we have what are our worker nodes, which were our old Docker nodes. And in front and behind both of those are load balancers. Now the load balancers are at both ends. So we have a load balancer externally so that when you access a service, let's say it's something through a URL, let's say it's the traffic dashboard, it will come into the front door and Kubernetes will load balance that if you have more than one instance. So for example, I run two, so I always have two available. And if, for example, let's go back to our Netflix analogy, 
when that movie comes out or that TV show, it will dynamically load balance that across all of those instances, which is great for performance and scalability. So in my example, sometimes I can see in my logs that I've accessed one machine and in another I can see that I've accessed the other one. Now this will vary from application to application because it will depend on which pod has access to the storage. We'll come on to that later. But there is a notion of applications need to be designed right to have true HA. This is especially true for things like databases because you can't have multiple applications writing to the same database. You would need a much more complex setup to be able to deal with that, but you likely wouldn't need that for a home lab. Next up in Kubernetes is networking. And this takes what we had in Docker to the next level. Now, there's multiple different ways of doing networking in Kubernetes, and you'll need to choose which is the right for you. But I do load balancing and external IPs. And I do this through something called Metal LB. We'll come on to that later. But effectively, what that does is create a virtual IP that's static within our Kubernetes cluster. And if you think about, well, how do you actually access something when you've got multiple containers? This is where it starts to make sense because Kubernetes internally is keeping a record of what the active IP address is for the service you want to access. So irrespective of where it's located physically or virtually on a machine, the IP address is always gonna to point to that container. So you could have multiple containers all sharing the same virtual IP and internally Kubernetes can load balance and distribute that workload. So that means no matter where I'm accessing from, whenever I hit traffic.jimsgarage.co.uk, it's always gonna be routed to traffic. And I don't really care which instance it's taking me to, Kubernetes sorts out all of that for me. Outside of that, and that's kind of where the magic lies, you've got your traditional things like node ports, which if you think about it, it's just gonna route it to the IP of the node. So a bit like Docker. So where we've done before, IP address and a port, that's kind of the same concept. And that might work for some applications, but it's not exactly scalable and it doesn't give us that high availability because if that node goes down, then that IP address isn't reachable. So the service isn't available, thus the service is down. So you can see the idea of why using an external load balanced IP makes a lot more sense because it's gonna be up and available because the container's gonna have failed over to the other node. There's also the notion of network policies, and those are a bit like ACLs, access control lists or firewall rules. And these are a lot more granular within Kubernetes than Docker. And those can do a load of magical things like restrict on different layers of the OSI model based upon what you're trying to do. So for example, you can block via IP address, you could block via container name, network name, all of those sorts of things. And we'll come on to that later when I touch on Kubernetes security. And now in terms of how do you manage Kubernetes, well, again, there's kind of two trains of thoughts. There's the tried and true command line interface, and you can use things like Kube control, which you will access through SSH and through the terminal. And I'll be covering that initially to get Kubernetes up and running. We'll then go into sort of the other way we can do it, which is through the web GUI when we deploy Rancher but we will definitely be coming back to the command line interface at various times throughout these videos because A, there's certain things that are just better done within the command line interface. And secondly, it's a great way to understand how to debug this and get some information out of it in case your GUI goes down because it will do when you're playing with this, <laughs> trust me. So hopefully that was a useful, and I do mean whistle-stop tour of Kubernetes. Like I say, I've got another six videos planned in this mini series and I'll be coming back to Kubernetes throughout our home lab journey in the future. Now, please do go and read the documentation for Kubernetes, familiarize yourself with the names and concepts. Now, in the next video, we're gonna be going through the prerequisites required for Kubernetes. And we're gonna need a video on this just because there's gonna be a number of virtual machines that we want to set up. And I'm gonna talk you through how to use cloud templates to do that, because cloud templates are designed for this kind of Kubernetes mindset, and it's a great way to set up multiple virtual machines in a quick and seamless fashion. So let me know if this is something that you're gonna be deploying in the future. Let me know any thoughts or comments or questions you've got, and I'll look to try and answer them in following videos. So if you've liked this video, please give it a like, drop a comment below, and make sure you hit that subscribe button. Take care, everybody, and we'll see you on the next one. Get those VMs ready.